Here's green. to uh, another virology lecture. We'll catch up next week since uh, blood bank bled into our time. Um, but we have another lecture Wednesday. We have lab on Tuesday and Thursday. And then we have test on Friday. So we'll be able to catch up on the Epstein bar and some of the other herpes there at the end. So today we're going to talk about Pycocornaviruses, orthomyxoviruses, and paramyxoviruses. So we'll start here, and um, so we we do the uh, the picorna viruses, and we kind of like we'll split this up to kind of help you with the names. But um, so pico is like one trillionth, right? So very very small. And then RNA pops up in there. So these are going to be RNA viruses. So that's kind of how the name came up. So you'll see a slide in just a second uh, that will show that. This is our largest family of viruses. It includes some of the most important human and animal viruses. It includes 250 different viruses. So a huge, huge group here. So we're going to touch on the, the important ones, of course. Uh, and some are going to sound familiar. Uh, and we have some really good info today. So there is where we got our name. So our uh, Pico, Pico, uh, small RNA viruses. Uh, this is uh, one that I used for um, my job interview. I did a hepatitis A vaccine. I mean, not vaccines, but hepatitis A, hepatitis break, outbreak here in town. Uh, and I know none of y'all were here for that, but that was one of the things that I got Mr. Payne to chuckle about because I basically went into that. I said, okay, so take the name, Pico, RNA viruses. And I heard him chuckle at that point. So I felt like I had hit a home run there. Uh, general characteristics, they're icosahedral again with their symmetry. They're single stranded. Okay, so single strand RNA, non enveloped, so they're uh, so resistant to ether and chloroform. The capsid of the enteroviruses is stable to heat and detergent, so it makes the enteroviruses very hard to treat. And except for rhinoviruses, they are also stable in acids. So here's a couple of our names we're going to focus on the entero and rhino. So here again, here's our two genera. Of medical importance, the rhinoviruses and the enteroviruses. So you've heard those, I think you've heard those, right? You've heard of rhinoviruses, hopefully, because that's where we're going to start. And rhino is the nose. Um, so these will be our common cold. So we're all familiar with the rhinoviruses. It is a, it has a simple genome, but it evolves. So its success is measured by survival and proliferation. And since we all still get colds, we know that it has this survival mode. Uh, the winner of the greatest viruses of them all is the rhinovirus because we still get it. We can't get rid of it. We can't seem to avoid catching it. Uh, somewhere on the order of 5% of humans are infected at any one time. And one of these has trillions of viruses. Uh, the amino acid is the, the key here, uh, present on the exposed region of the capsid which binds to the cell surface, proteins of your cells, enables the virus to infect those cells, is constantly changing. So this is where if you put a vaccine together and you said, hey, we're gonna give a vaccine for the common cold, next year, it's different. And you don't know where to begin because the, every virus could be different. There could be so many at any one time. Like this room could have one and then we could go across campus to the dorm and that, that group could have a different one. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't even begin to know what kind of vaccine to develop. The disease is the common cold, occurs in fall and spring, 
but against your grandmother's advice or your mother's advice, it's not because it's cold outside. Keep that in mind. So we get to share it. And this from lab yesterday, you're very familiar with this. And we all know that what? That this right here is the nasopharynx area that we, we, we got to a few times yesterday, but most of the time we were up in here right with our swab yesterday so we have to move this way but here's all that runny nose nasal congestion swelling here causing the nasal congestion that we get and annoys us the most here's the back of the throat my back of the throat's burning because of my nasal drainage down the back uh, that seems to be like number one on my kids list is my throat hurts well if you had a runny nose i'm not sure but yeah i have have been blowing it a few, yes, probably gonna be this. Give them a, you know, the antihistamine that stop the drainage and that usually takes care of the, the sore throat. So how do we get it? Easy enough, right? Exposure to cold temperatures does not increase your susceptibility. What cold does is put you in the room together. So increasing your closeness increasing your I don't go outside during the winter it's too cold so we all stay in the house um, that's where you increase your chance so hopefully I think I don't know us you know you can tell me or not how many have you got a cold this winter one two Anybody, did you know everybody else it says you know usually I get like two or three or two or three times or at least once right we didn't did we wonder why. Hmm. I hope we learn a lot from this. Just, you know, we've seen the signs in the past, like for flu, right? For, we're going to go over influenza in just a minute, but wash your hands, wash your hands, hand sanitizer, wash your hands. You know, don't touch your face. Stay six feet apart. All right. May or may not keep that in mind. Hopefully we will. Sneezing and coughing, yes, that's where we've transmit it because uh, saliva is expelled when we cough and sneeze and the rhinoviruses are shed in those nasal secretions. Not saliva, but in the nasal secretions that are expressed during coughing and sneezing. How do we get it? Shaking hands, touching something that somebody has sneezed on or touched, grabbed, uh, hands are infected, so this is the transfer that we worry most about. So all the little, you know, hey, 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 well, how do we slow down a virus spread? This is where we started, right, last year. So just in case you have a problem, you know, touching your face, touching your nose, tables, door knot. Hey, we even wipe down tabletops, don't we, after we left the room. Wow. Uh, uninfected person inoculates themselves after they come in behind you uh, just by touching your what desk chair maybe I see hands on your desk right now right so just some things that maybe we need to practice a little more now that we know uh, rhinoviruses are easily transmissible because the virus is shed a few days before you what show your symptoms hmm. stop me when you've heard this story before right Infected persons or those around you, they're unaware they have it because they hadn't started sneezing and coughing and, you know, all that muck in your nose and stuff, but you're spreading it at that time. So shedding the virus well in advance of the symptoms. Best means of control for the rhino virus is hand washing and avoiding contact with hands, eyes, and nose. 50% of rhino infections are asymptomatic. The virus is still shed. Vaccine's not likely because of large number of serial types and antigenic shift. So again, you know, if you see that word right there, antigenic shift, you see that, right? So the quicker, 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 quicker we can get vaccinated for something going on today, quicker, quicker, quicker we'll shut down these variants and antigenic shifts. Uh, that's the key. Because if we, if we don't, then we're just going to keep riding this little train out and hopefully not. Hopefully we'll get rid, rid of it. But uh, laboratory diagnosis rarely attempted just because what? You go see the doctor out of cold, right? I know because your symptoms tell me you probably have a cold. It's 
probably from a rhinovirus, which I don't have anything to give you to keep that from happening. So you're just gonna have to ride out and treat the symptoms with your decongestion, your fever control if you get fever, um, and your cough suppressants. Antibody to rhinoviruses persists for years. So this gives us the idea that once we've had it, right, we have, won't see that one again, right? And there could be some, what, crossover, of course, it could be some help. So the older we get, the more chances we've been exposed to colds and we quit getting colds. So, you know, those snotty little kids that are, you know, are in daycare, they're, they haven't been exposed to as many. So they're having, that's why we consider uh, children getting colds every often. Um, that's why. All right, so that was rhinoviruses, right? The enterovirus family divided into four groups based on three criteria. They're clinical syndromes, cytopathic effect, disease produced in lab animals. There are a large number of human enterovirus stereotypes. So again, a lot, lot, lot in these groups. So here is our list. We have four groups of enteroviruses. We have polio, types one through three. We have Coxsackie viruses, A1 through 24, and B1 through six. We have one through 34 echoviruses. We have enteroviruses, 68 through 116, and then species types, enterovirus A through J. And then on enterovirus 72, right, that genus of 68 through 116, we have our hepatitis A virus. So our enterovirus family has one of our, our familiar hepatitis that we see. Infecting an estimated 50 million people a year. lot to take in there, but just, I think the idea is to get, there are very, very many, 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 many subtypes. So why? Because they're very resistant to disinfectants. They're not destroyed by 70% alcohol or phenolic compounds like Lysol. So all of our work we've been doing, right? All of our, let's wipe down, right? Right? Like this is alcohol wipes, right? We've had Lysol wipes. They're inactivated by chlorine though. We had chlorine wipes, but the effectiveness is decreased by the presence of organic matter. They're not removed by conventional wastewater treatment. I thought everything was removed by wastewater treatment, right? Hmm. We put chlorine in our water, right? Do we treat it? So back to, you know, just those little stories we've been hearing for this past year, I think I mentioned it, but we have some researchers that are looking at wastewater for COVID outbreaks. Monitoring the number of detected COVID viruses in wastewater is giving an idea of who is actually, where is the hot spot. Um, but for enteroviruses, diseases vary from asymptomatic to symptomatic, but most are asymptomatic, which is good. They're by far the most common cause of aseptic meningitis in children. 30 million to 50 million infections in the US are responsible for 30 to 50,000 hospitalizations a year. Aseptic meningitis, which may be fatal, is most common in our infants less than one year old. We do get a febrile illnesses, their most common clinical syndrome. In most cases, respiratory symptoms are present at that point. In most cases occur in young children. How do we get it? Fecal oral route. Makes sense, right? Because we've been told that with Hep A. Hopefully you remember that with the Hep A outbreak here in town. Restaurants, restaurants, food handlers, going to the bathroom, not washing their hands, or not washing their hands effectively, coming out, fixing your food, handing you your burger, you go home, eat your burger, and then you ended up with Hep A. Okay. Human feces, the main source of infection, fresh bathing water, swimming pools, all right, all that's about to open back up. Respiratory droplets shed from the throat, 
and we can actually have insect vectors such as flies and cockroaches. How would that happen? We get on the feces, maybe. You know. The virus enters the oral cavity and multiplies in your GI tract, eventually reaching your lymph nodes. And then it disseminates through the blood to the target organs, and we have target organs for our enterovirus groups: polio, the meninges. Those are what the coverings of all your nerves and your brain. Coxsackie B part, Coxsackie A and B, and echovirus is the skin. Specimen for the lab, throat, feces, cerebral spinal fluid, blood. Technique, serology, most part, for any lab. Virus isolation could, but most of the time we're gonna do a serology. So let's take a look, polio. Have you heard of polio? Have you been vaccinated for polio? You used to have to be. I was like this close, right? Born in 1967. Used to be one of those mandatory vaccines. Um, causes a febrile illness, which progresses to aseptic uh, meningitis, occasionally an irreversible paralysis. So I grew up with, uh, you know, people in the community as I was growing up, uh, debilitating look to an arm or to a leg, a limp. Uh, it was caused by polio. They got polio as a kid. 90% uh, of the infections are asymptomatic. A small percentage go into a mild febrile illness and one to 2% lead to serious neurological manifestations or 0.1% or 0.1% result in frank paralysis. So that's what I was seeing. There were some, I've seen it in certain people in my lifetime. They're you know, well past gone now, but I remember. Um, in 1916, an epidemic re broke out. Unless I love the history because these history, as it repeats itself, we seem shocked, right, about what we did this past year. Like, oh my God, unprecedented, right? Oh, in my lifetime, I've never seen such a thing, right? All those words were used, and like, where do they get this? Why are they doing this? And why are they doing that? Well, take 100 years earlier, right? 27,000 cases of polio, symptomatic. More than 6,000 deaths happened. Polio was a plague. You'd wake up with a headache. Next day, you were paralyzed. The names and addresses of individuals with confirmed polio cases were published daily in the press. We we're close to that, weren't we, this past year? I mean, we kind of kind of like, hey, we had dashboards and we had contact tracers, you know, give us the names of all the guilty, right? Who all did you give it to? Who all have you been around? We need to call, we need to, they were published daily in the press. Houses were identified with placards and families were quarantined. You had a polio outbreak. Called widespread panic, thousands fled the city, going to the mountains, I'm leaving town. Don't need to be around a lot of people. Movies closed. Meetings were canceled. Public gatherings were almost non-existent. Children were warned not to drink from water fountains. Told to avoid amusement parks, swimming pools, and beaches. Shut everything down. Sound familiar? Onward for 1916, the epidemic appeared each summer. So again, people have said, what? We may see this every year from COVID. We may see it come, like, is it going to be seasonal? Is it going to be appear every so often until we finally eradicate? Polio epidemic appeared each summer in at least one part of the country. They had hot spots. Most serious, look, 196 from the 40s, so that's like 30 years later. We still had outbreaks of polio. 1949, 2,700 deaths from disease occurred in the United States. 42,000 cases were reported. We see them. So how did we eradicate it? And it has been, for the most part, 99% eradicated, okay? I won't go 100% on anything. There's always a story from somewhere in the world that pops up and says, 
the confirmed case of polio, okay, or confirmed case of something we thought we'd gotten rid of. Current efforts to eradicate were, was immunization. Best means to eliminate the virus from the human population. There were two types of vaccines available, an intramuscular injection of an inactivated killed strain, all right, so everybody's like, oh, I remember the history books told me y'all gonna give me something, y'all gonna give me that virus, right? You're gonna inactivate it, but it's still there. And hopefully after yesterday's, this past week's effort to kind of understand our vaccines that we currently are using this week, oral administration of an attenuated strain. So history, world history, Vaccination clinics, you're seeing that today, right? Only thing missing here is we don't have masks, right? We kind of the same setup. Everybody getting attenuated, either drops on the tongue or getting shot in the arm. Yeah, we've seen this. I mean, this this kind of looks like FedEx, right? All right, loading them up. We've seen pick. We've seen these, right? They've gone to the FedEx in Memphis and showed you the warehouse where they're being stored. All right, kind of the same setup here. We got boxes, just don't have minus 80 fr uh, fridges in those boxes, but we're rolling them out. Got the vaccine rolling out worldwide. Let's say dude's got a cigarette there in his hand. If you look close, that's... Here we are. This is a little uh, childhood. Everybody's happy, right? There's the oral drops of the attenuated strain. I'm giving you a little button right here, a little button down here on the, the table. See that? Looks like he's putting something on like a sugar cube or something to give to, to eat. Iron lung. Remember the history of the iron lung? I remember uh, hearing about people that had lung cancer. They put them in the iron lung to help. Polio paralysis, debilitating. Forming. So was it, has it been eradicated? There have been, there has been a greater than 99.99% decline worldwide since the launch of the World Health Assembly's Global Polio Eradication Initiative. This decrease is attributed to the extensive use of the live attenuated oral polio vaccine, mass vaccination campaign, comprehensive national routine immunization programs. Very, 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 uh, past history, we hope, we feel that way. So what has happened since then among the three wild polio viruses, stereotypes, only type one has been detected since 2012. Type two was last detected in 1999. And, and a global wild polio virus two eradication was declared in 2015. Type three has not been detected since 2012. Uh, residual endemic, Transmission has been detected in places, I think Pakistan was the last one I saw, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nigeria, in inaccessible areas. Right. All right, so that is our polio story. Did y'all enjoy that? So hopefully you're seeing like, like what did we live through? Like it's not unprecedented. It was worse at one point, right? Yes, we've had things that we're not accustomed to, like shutting down and being told to stay home and wear a mask and get a vaccine, but it's not new, okay, not new. Enterovirus, Coxsackie viruses, they're associated with febrile illness, which may result in a, a reversible paralytic disease infrequently. We got Coxsackie A associated with this herpangina, um, and hand, foot, mouth disease. And I think everybody's familiar with hand, foot, mouth disease. That's one of those daycare outbreaks every year. Uh, the toys, you know, hadn't been cleaned and kids play, put them in their mouth. And then they come home with this break outbreak around um, their mouth. 2009, Coxsackie virus A6 caused a herpangina uh, condition in which small blisters form in the back of the throat, the roof of the mouth. And the virus is a leading cause of hand, foot, mouth disease worldwide. A 
Sacky B viruses are associated with myocarditis, so don't get mixed up. Coxsackie A, hand, foot, mouth disease. Coxsackie B, myocarditis, heart disease. So why is it cardiac? Because we said it would go to a certain organ, goes to the heart. Cardiac muscles infected. Not good, right? You know, we would never think that would be good. We have echo viruses. So echoes are enteric cytopathic human orphan viruses associated with skin rashes, febrile respiratory illness, meningitis, and paralysis. Rash. Orthomyxoviridae family. And this is where we get influenza. So we're going to spend some time in influenza. Because why? We didn't have an influenza outbreak this year, did we? Y'all remember any? Were there any health alerts? Any notices that, oh my gosh, we're increasing? Right? Maybe learn something, didn't we? Sent that to the dean the other day. She sent out a little notice and said, hey, have you noticed, hey, the influenza numbers are down. I was like, yeah, maybe you learned something from wearing a mask. And then she shot back and social distancing. <laughs> so that's what we're here. We're here to learn things, right? We're here that we have actually seen what can be done. Are we going to do it again? Next, next November, are you going to put a mask on? Wash your hands, wear a mask in class. We're going to see if you've separated six. No, we're not right. Anybody watch baseball games yesterday? Anybody, nobody? Nobody's a baseball fan. They're filling up the stands again. All right? They are wearing masks a little bit, but are like when we go out here to the big football field next fall, are we going to, um, Preston, you going to social distance in the student section, wear a mask in the fall? Probably not, right? You don't know? <laughs> I don't know. Only if it's called for, right? It makes, it makes, it makes a point sense. to the fan, like TV audience. Um, but yeah, I mean, so we we have influence is where influenza came from. It's derived from the medieval astrologers of Florence who attributed the flu-like illness to the influence of the stars. So you get a, where these names came from, so great. We can't argue that, right? That's that's some deep stuff there from our Italian friends. The influenza viruses got four types or three types. Go with the three. A, B, C. Determined by their nucleoprotein antigens, and that goes a long way in naming these. So we're going to see that. We're going to see how these got named. So influenza A. If you were ask the question, which one's worse, A or B? I hope you would jump on A, stay there. Uh, it infects humans, but also other animals, especially pigs, horses, and birds. But influenza B and C, we don't hear a whole lot about C. We always hear uh, A and B, and we'll tell you why. Uh, infects humans only. So A is, is variety, some animals, but B and C are definitely human only influences. So what are they? They're RNA viruses. They have eight segments of single-stranded RNA. They are enveloped. They are helical viruses. There we go. See the envelope around them. So viral antigens, we're very familiar with this. We're very familiar with glycoproteins embedded in the lipid bilayer of the envelope. And they're called spikes, which we got yesterday. Projections of the virus surface that determine the subtype of the virus. This is what we're, where we're going to focus. We're going to focus on hemagglutins. You know, this came out of blood bank quiz, right? You know hemagglutins, right? React with glycoproteins on the surface of the red cell, causing hemagglutination. Hmm. hmm. 
keep that in mind, blood bankers. The infection process of influenza A depends on the viral hemagglutin binding to the sialic acid residues are on the glycans of airway epithelial cells. No, that's a big sentence there. The sialic acid's residues allow attachment and initiation of infection. Antibodies that you develop, right, to hemagglutin prevents infection and is therefore protective against reinfection. So we wouldn't see if we were doing a test, right? If we're testing for the virus, we'd see what? Agglutination. This goes back to immunology. If we have antibodies developed against it, we wouldn't see agglutination, right? So that's where we wouldn't see a agglutination reaction if we had protective antibodies. And once those antibodies block the attachment, then we don't get transmission. We have another thing called the neuramidase, the neuraminidase antigens, the NA, they're found on type A and B, but not C. So you can see why we're kind of getting away from C at this point. Neuramidases facilitate the release of the virus from the infected cells. So they play a big role. They're an enzyme because they have ACE at the end, right? There are 16 hemagglutins, H1 through H16. And there's nine neuramidases which is N1 through N9. So have you heard of any influenzas named by certain things? What have you heard? Come on and give me one. H1N1, have you heard of that before? Let's just take the first one. But that's where the name comes from where that H1N1 comes from. That's the hema, gluten, H, and the neuramidases, the N. So we have 16 H's and nine neuramidases to be in any of the combinations. Many different combinations are possible. Each combination is considered a different subtype. And the subtypes are even further broken down into different strains. Remember, we're on the orthomyxoviruses before we change. How many RNA strands we got in here? It's Friday. How many? Is it eight? Eight? Six or eight? What was it? From the notes. We need to go back. Eight, right? RNA virus with eight segments of single-stranded RNA. There they are. Okay. The hemagglutins are out here. They're the light blue. The neuramidases are the dark blue. Okay, we got some ion channels. So what happens when we have a pandemic? You all know what a pandemic is, right? It's a worldwide outbreak occurs every 10 years with influenza A. There's an antigenic shift. After that outbreak, the virus undergoes a change from one hemagglutin or neuramidases to another. H2, N2 to H3, N2 or H3, N2 to H1, N1. So that antigenic shift all right, the virus is undergoing a change in their, what, their lineup of their hemagglutins or neuramidases. The antigenic drift, only a minor change. So you don't change the whole number system. Only a minor change in the amino acid sequence is found in the hemagglutin or neuramidase. The subtype remains the same. That's the difference between shift and drift. Shift is more big. It's a bigger, bigger change than the drift. So we describe the influenza A strains by their nucleoprotein specificity, A, B, or C. The original host, if not human, so we throw that in there. It's not. The geographic distribution, I know that's political at this point, but that's the way it's done. 
So you see Hong Kong sitting there. You see Mass. I'm taking that's uh, Massachusetts. I don't know if that's Massachusetts. It has to be something like that. Uh, isolate number, one, one. See that right after the, the place of distribution. Year isolated, 80, 68, 1980 or 1968. And then there is the subtype. H7N7, H3N2, so now you know, right? So that's influenza A found in a seal in Massachusetts, I'm, yeah, I'm just guessing. Se uh, isolate number one, 1980, and we got H7N7. Remember type A can infect animals too. So you wouldn't see an, an animal here for B. So here's some pandemics, right? We said these happen every 10 years. 1918, H1N1, 3% case fatality rate. It was 30 years later when it came back in 1947. 10 years later, H2N2, 1968, H3N2, 1978, H1N1. That was a 30 year difference here. Went from 30 years, 1947, showed back up. And then another 30 years, H1N1 showed up 2009. So 1976, Fort Dix, H1N1, 1918, 2009, 2011 H3N2, 2011 H3N2. So what is the clinical significance of influenza A? It's often asymptomatic, you have, or it could be mild, fever, chills, myalgia, sore throat, cough. Fatalities occur if the illness progresses to viral pneumonia or a secondary bacterial pneumonia follows. Influenza virus B and influenza C have milder diseases. So again, if we test for A on our little test strip, we have patients that test for A and B at the same time. Okay, I don't understand exactly how sometimes, but I've had tests where I have rolled out a swab out of the nose for an influenza test, looking for antigens and end up with positive A and B. Huh. Long way, six feet, three feet, maybe 10, I don't know. Run, right, sometime. Rye syndrome, associated with it, encephalopathy. This is serious because if you're a new parent, you may heard this, but you don't really know why. So fever in a young child definitely don't want to give aspirin. Okay, so that's where it's associated with. That's why Tylenol is so important and um, Motrin, Advil, any of those are good to go, uh, but you don't, you want to stay away from aspirin. It was often fatal and has been associated with influenza B, less frequently with A. So you're not really, you know, it's not the worst of the flus, but you are running a little fever. Let me take an aspirin and then you end up causing a lot of issues, big issues. Vaccination, the best means to prevent it. Formula inactivated virus grown in eggs. So you got a little taste of that yesterday, not the egg itself, but you got an idea of people that are allergic. It's usually, they will ask, is this a vaccine produced in eggs? Because I might have a reaction to that. Most of the time, if you've gotten your, who may have got the flu vaccine this year? Okay, all right, good. Do you have to have it before you go to clinical? Okay. You know, we're starting your clinicals in the summer. Then, yeah. All right. Um, most people in the U.S. receive a, a quadrivalent vaccine, which has two strains of A and two strains of B, which has been like, okay, what are we seeing in the winters in the other parts of the world, and can we develop our flu vaccine? And sometimes that can delay the vaccine uh, because we're not, not sure which two variants we want to put in there. But they are changing those. It's not like we don't ever change those. Those are every year there's a change in that vaccine. 
to help prevent the one that's coming or hope to predict which one is going to hit the United States. So it's a lot of work there. Orthomyxoviruses, chemotherapy, we have Tamiflu, which is also its official name is Oseltamivir, right, an antiviral. And then we have uh, Relenza, which is a Xanamivir. It's also, an, they are neuramidase inhibitors. Okay, so that's how they are an antiviral. So if you don't have the neuramidases, what was the neuramidase for? For the virus to get out of the cell. So that is a block at that point. Uh, Zofluza, right, is the, about the newest one that just came out for treatment of acute uncomplicated influenza in patients 12 years or older and have been symptomatic for no more than 48 hours. So when you go in with flu and you get, or feel like you got the flu and you get tested, and then they kind of, they ask how long, you know, have you been suffering from these symptoms? And you say, well, for two weeks, chances are you may not get the Tamiflu or you may not get the Zofluza uh, because they are more effective if catched early. So if you just start off and just said, you know, I woke up feeling like this today, you're probably going to get it. So, and it's to, it's the antivirals to, for not to prevent you from what, you know, it's to stop it, okay? So it slows it down so you don't have this ongoing flu replication in your body and, and that. So we have a new one, so Fluza, the Tamiflu you may have heard or even had before uh, if you have been tested positive for the flu. So that's why that little quick flu test we use, the antigen test is so important, is because the doctor, once they see that, and they got the symptoms, just go ahead and give you Tamiflu uh, or Zofluza. So prevent the flu, yes we have. <laughs> Magically this year we have, right? Wow. Um, there's the flu zone uh, from your, the immunization. There we are getting our flu shot. Uh, I'll do it like this. If y'all seen the TV commercials, I know we're about to run out of time. You seen the TV commercials where they say this was taken before the pandemic. That's why they're not wearing masks. So they were being cautious at this point. I don't know if y'all caught that or not. Uh, so we here we have immunizations from 1957, historical pictures, 76, flu miss, which I do not recommend. I will not recommend that. That is very um, risky for me. Because uh, I was warned that it it's not it can be a complication if you throw it up there against the brain bar barrier, uh, not what you want to do. So take the shots in the arm over the nasal mist. For us, we do an antigen test. It's one of our most used tests. Um, flu and strep uh, from the ER all day long, all weekend long. If you if you've got an experience yet. Um, this is always fun to end with because uh, men, you know, there's only a few of us in the room, but we do have a, a stronger tech. We, we're not just whining, right? If we come up with a respiratory illness, it is, it is more serious. We need to take, take, take care of us a little better. Don't think we're just whining. I think you made that up. No, I, this is, it's in the slide. It's from Dr. Kyle Sue. Um, <laughs> There's evidence current point men have a weaker immune system than women, especially when it comes to respiratory infections. So if we if we gotta get in the bed and stay there for a few days, y'all. So y'all are the weaker species, is what you're saying. I am saying that, yes. <laughs> Paramyxovir days and pneumovir day families. Look at these pretty quickly. So um, not much left. Enveloped helical viruses, large size, pleomorphic, single strand RNA. Um, is that, are they going to be in class after I try to see people roaming out there? How much time? Are we out of time? Okay. All right. I don't want to sell measles short, so I'm going to stop here uh, and come back uh, with our mumps and measles. Okay, so we'll, we'll catch up, I promise. All right, see you have a good weekend. I don't know why my time has been so limited this time.
I might have to check my other recordings to see what I did last year. Why, why does it seem like I'm running out of time? All right. Have a good weekend.